Welcome to today's webinar. Today, we will discuss rural housing in the fiscal year 2025 White House budget. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Samantha Booth has been the Government Relations Manager at the Housing Assistance Council since 2019. Prior to that, she spent five years working on rural housing issues as a legislative staffer in the U.S. Senate. She lives in Bozeman, Montana. Jonathan Harwitz is Director of Public Policy at the Housing Assistance Council. Prior to joining HAC, Jonathan was Director of Housing, Community Development, and Insurance Policy for the House Financial Services Committee. He also served as Managing Director of Federal Policy and Government Affairs at the Low Income Investment Fund, a large national community development financial institution. And now I will hand the presentation over to Jonathan. Great. Uh, thanks, Dan um, and Stephanie. Um, I am thankful that uh, uh, I'm not being asked to talk about the AHRV program because I have no expertise in that. <laughs> um, we're here today to talk about uh, the president's budget for fiscal year uh, 2025. Um, and I'm going to start uh, off and then turn it over to, to Sam and then I will come back. Uh, but I, I'm going to start off with what I kind of call the the civics 101 of the budget and appropriations process. And as you guys will see as I talk about this, that it's sort of, the, you know, the, the, this slide is, is becoming less and less reflective of the reality. But just to give you an idea of how this is supposed to work in um, the budget process for any fiscal year, first step is the, the president proposes a budget. Uh, and that typically happens the first uh, uh, week of February. Um, you may have noticed that we're not in February anymore. Um, you know, it has uh, been sort of moving later and and sort of particularly later and later, but particularly, um, you know, as, as as administrations move forward, uh, and particularly when you have a split Congress, there tends to be uh, it, it starts a uh, um, a little uh, a little bit. Uh, later. Um, and then uh, what is supposed to happen in Congress is that uh, the budget committees in both the House and Senate Senate um, establish a, a top line number uh, for what's one of the, the sort of three big uh, uh, or for two of the three big uh, elements of the of the federal budget. The two big elements are uh, do domestic discretionary uh, spending and and defense, uh, and the last uh, uh, the second part is what's called mandatory spending. I'm going to be coming back to that. That's things like entitlements, like Medicaid, Medicare. Um, so uh, the budget committees are supposed to uh, kind of um, you know like you would in a household. Uh, you know, uh, what's your income and then what's the what's your you know, what's your cap for spending for the year? Uh, and then that is uh, that number uh, is sent to the uh, Senate and House Appropriations Committees uh, and they get what's supposed to be called a 302 a uh, inside the Beltway speak, which is the top line number for all the appropriations bills, including the ones we care about, uh, like HUD and USDA. Uh, and then um, uh, from that, uh, the leaders of the appropriations committees uh, allocate what's called the 302B to all the different subcommittees. So, for example, um, uh, the agriculture uh, uh, appropriations subcommittee uh, gets a 302B, as does the subcommittee uh, for transportation and HUD. Uh, and the challenge, though, is that when you have a situation, I, I think we're now we're, we're well into our third decade of it not really working like this, uh, but it really doesn't work like this um, when you have uh, a split Congress. Um, so what you end up uh, seeing with a split Congress is uh, that there is no budget resolution passed and, you know, one house, uh, one chamber uh does their appropriations bills to one number uh and the other does it to the other and typically 
uh, you see uh, whichever chamber is controlled by Republicans writing what we call writing to a, a lower a lower number. Uh, and then um, if uh, you can't get to an agreement on a top line number or as we had this year where there seems like there's an agreement to a top line number, uh, but then um, there's a, 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 a challenge uh, in one of the chambers, which has been the, the House, um, uh, sticking to that agreement, you have to decide, well, uh, if you can't resolve it, do you have continuing re a continuing resolution to keep the government open or a government shutdown? Uh, and I think, um, as people have, have seen probably following the news, um, we've uh, had uh, uh, CRs happening uh you know, up until now, um, and one one portion of the, or uh, you know, the, the portion of the budget that we care about for fiscal year 2024 has been resolved, but there's still elements that need to be resolved. Uh, and just, I should say, uh, for those who might not know, the federal fiscal year starts October 1st. So we're now uh, almost halfway through the, the fiscal year that the budget was supposed to have already been enacted for. <laughs> And, uh, you know, so this is obviously not a way to run um, uh, run a railroad, um, but it, it, we are where we are. Um, so at this point, we're uh, uh, as the FY24 process is being finalized, we are going to talk about what's in the fiscal year 2025 um, budget. And the critical point to know here uh, is that uh, uh, this budget, with respect to, again, domestic discretionary funding, um, is governed by the Fiscal Responsibility Act of uh, 2023. And this agreement allows for a spending increase only of about 1% in FY25 compared to FY24, um, which is not a lot of money. Um, you know, which means that on the domestic discretionary side, there is uh, there's a significant limit to what the president can uh, propose. Uh, and as uh, noted here, this budget was uh, written before the FY24 appropriations were finalized. So it, 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 they were forced to rely on kind of a, a, a somewhat on both FY23 levels and some assumptions about where FY24 was likely to, to land. I think we feel like it it kind of has landed, you know, somewhere in that range. But again, it's really not ideal at all uh, to be formulating your next budget without knowing what your current budget um, is. But I will just uh, say that the important thing to know, uh, because we'll come back to it, is that um, mandatory spending proposals are not subject to these spending caps. And that will um, that will come into play um uh, as we'll see shortly so uh so now i'm going to turn it over to sam um to talk about uh the key usda programs great thank you jonathan um so uh, i'm sure many of you on this call are uh deeply involved in the housing programs <clears throat> at usda so we wanted to start with a little overview of the FY25 White House budget for those programs. Um, on this first slide, you can see uh, some of USDA's multifamily programs. Um, this is a good example of where those spending caps that Jonathan just mentioned come into play when you compare this year's budget to past White House budgets. Um, in previous years, the administration had proposed um, a really significant increase for the Section 515 multifamily program. Um, I believe up to 200 million was what had been proposed um, in the last few years. But you can see here for FY25, in order to stay within those budget caps, um, they had to drop that proposal back down to just sort of relatively level funding um, at 70 million. Um, but that program has seen some some small but really important increases over the last few years. Um, and as I'm sure many of you know, there hasn't been any new construction in the 515 program in over a decade. So all of this funding goes towards um, the preservation of existing properties with maturing loans. 
Um, and then similarly, similarly for the 514 and 516 farm labor housing programs, um, you can see that they're relatively level funded in the White House budget um, at 25 million and 10 million. Um, there's a little increase for Section 521 rental assistance, um, which is good to see. And then they've also proposed level funding for the 538 um, Preservation Loan Guarantee Program. Um, and then if we move on to uh, the multifamily preservation funding programs, um, we Hack was really excited to see this proposed increase for the MPR program, um, especially kind of in this constrained funding environment. Um, it's good to see the administration still putting a strong focus on increasing funding for these preservation programs. Um, as you can see here in the uh, FY23 final deal, there was 36 million for MPR. Um, 34 million in FY24, and then the FY25 budget has proposed 90 million. So really great increase there. Um, and there's so much need out there for these NPR funds um, that that's that's a good increase to see. Um, there was a slight decrease in the budget for vouchers, um, but Hack's assumption at this point is that that um, kind of takes into account the decoupling strategy that USDA is pursuing for the preservation of their multifamily portfolio. Um, so going forward, they wouldn't they wouldn't foresee needing as much voucher funding because these decoupled properties would be continuing to get RA. Um, we were disappointed to see that there wasn't any funding in the White House budget for the Preservation Technical Assistance Program, which is a really small but powerful program that helps uh, small nonprofits pre uh, preserve these important properties, um, especially in kind of lower capacity regions of the country. Um, and there also was not any funding for a program called the Preservation Revolving Loan Fund. Um, this program actually hasn't received funding in many years. It was funded back in the early 2000s um, and was another important kind of source of preservation funding, but it hasn't received funding through the appropriations process in quite a while and was also not included um, in the president's budget, but we do like to continue to include it um, in these kind of forums just to keep it on everybody's radar as an important program that, that should be refunded in Hack's opinion. Um, now to kind of jump over to the single family side of the USDA housing programs. Um, here you can see a couple of the kind of flagship single family programs, the 502 uh, direct and guarantee. Um, the 502 direct program took a big hit um, in this past year. Uh, as you can see, it was cut from 1.25 billion to 880 million in the most recent funding deal. Um, but we were glad to see the White House budget kind of restored that funding back to, to the previous 1.25 billion level. Um, and it's also important to note that there is kind of a demonstration set aside pro, uh, pool of funding within 502 direct for the native CDFI. 502 relending, um, which is a concept that Hack has been very supportive of and has been really successful um, in the regions of the country where it's been used thus far. Um, that was kind of begun a few years ago in South Dakota. And then on the guarantee side for 502, um, we see pretty much level funding um, with the past couple of years proposed in the budget. And then to continue on with a few more of the single family programs at USDA, um, the 504 home repair loans and grants were relatively level funded um, in the White House budget. This program um, has kind of been challenged in the last few years with getting all the funding that they've been receiving um, obligated and out the door, not that there is not a great need on the ground. It's more just a kind of challenging um, 
amount of red tape, I, I would say, around the program that, that makes it a little tough to get some of that funding out the door. Um, in the FY23 final bill, we actually saw some, F, from, some 504 funding rescinded. Um, so that was that was unfortunate to see um, and definitely something that Hack is interested on the policy side in in resolving, you know, the issues within that program to kind of streamline how that funding is able to to go out. Um, and then same thing with 523 self-help and 533 housing preservation grants. They were relatively level funded um, in the White House budget. So glad to see those continuing to be included as well. And I believe this is our last USDA slide, but we did want to include um, some information on the co community facilities programs. Um, there was a pretty steep cut, as you can see here, in the community facilities loan program. Um, we don't have any kind of additional information yet explaining what kind of precipitated that cut, um, but it's definitely something that we're going to be tracking and um, the rest of the community facilities programs were relatively level funded, um, but that loan number I know is causing a little bit of concern within the stakeholder community. Um, and so we're gonna be keeping a close eye on that as the process moves forward this year. And with that, I will turn it back over to Jonathan for um, the, HUD side of the budget. Great, thanks, Sam. Um, and in 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 one regard, this is going to be uh, fairly similar um, to to what Sam just described on the USDA front, um, which is uh, you know kind of a little bit more of the same and and some some incremental bright spots. Um, uh, you know, and a few a few disappointments, but I think um, you know, folks know that that uh, if you work with HUD programs, that the the major driver uh, in the uh, uh, HUD budget is what it costs to renew rental assistance um, in the uh, large uh, rental assistance programs, um, and the analyses you could see for uh, uh, tenant based uh, rental assistance um, that. They're uh, anticipating, uh, you know, nearly nearly 400 million in growth, and and the analyses that are out there from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities and others suggest that it should be enough to renew all existing vouchers, um, and that there uh, will be enough in the project-based rental assistance program um, to extend all uh, contracts for for 12 12 months, um, which is good, um, and uh, you can see. Um, uh, unfortunately, some cuts in uh, uh, the public housing capital and public housing operating fund. Um, and there I will just um, make a little note. I think uh, I'm not sure uh, I will look away for a second, but 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 one of the the whether well, Sam mentioned that one of the important non-budgetary things that came out of the FY uh, 24 process was um, in the USDA programs. Um, the ability to decouple uh, the 515 mortgage from the uh, 521 rental assistance for a thousand unit pilot, um, which is exciting. And the reason I mentioned that in the context of public housing capital and operating is that um, there are some similarities between that um, and an initiative, uh, 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 an initiative that's been around for well over a decade now called the Rental Assistance Demonstration or RAD. Um, and uh, you know, unfortunately, I think because of the success of RAD, there has been, um, you know, uh, you know, some ability, uh, you know, uh, or belief that you can, you know, um, reduce public public housing capital and operating. Well, actually, you can. Pro pro units that have left and have been redeveloped for RAD, they may have moved to a different platform. But nonetheless, I think there's been some disappointment in in um, uh, you know uh, these two numbers here. Um, uh, CDBG and and home, um, I think uh, the uh, couple of, uh, uh, of well, one exciting thing is that we've seen the home program, which uh, at one point dipped below a billion dollars, 
um, is now at uh, 1.25 billion. That's a long way away from its peak of 1.8 uh, billion. Um, you know, uh, uh, during the uh, in the early 2000s, even so, obviously inflation inflation adjusted, we're not even close to keeping pace. But um, you know, it is exciting to get it to this point, and and I think many of us who are uh, in this field are eagerly awaiting um, a a major rulemaking around home, uh, which we will help, um, which we hope will set the stage for increased appropriations going forward. Um, we are looking at, um, you know, a lower number uh, proposed for uh, CDBG. Um, you can see, uh, uh, but that's really for the formula grants. The uh, uh, the CDBG number, if you recall, a couple of years ago, earmarks are back or congressionally directed spending, and um, the enacted amounts um, for FY24 include that. Um, but again, I, I think this is another uh, example where uh, CDBG has, I think it's uh, up to, you know, it's lost almost 90% of its value relative to um, when it when it started in 1974. So again, we, we need to see some more growth uh, there, uh, but it's kind of a steady state. Um, and uh, other, a uh, couple other key initiatives, uh, here, choice neighborhoods, uh, slight increase proposed um, for redeveloping uh, uh, pub, uh, public housing projects or uh, uh, project-based rental assistance projects that are in disrepair. Um, for uh, Native American housing, I think we're pretty um, uh, excited at the increase um, in FY24, uh, 1.344 uh, billion. Uh, unfortunately, the president's budget is 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 a little bit lower. Um, so hopefully, we can see some progress uh, on that. Uh, the administration continues its commitment um, uh, to homeless around homelessness. We're we're talking about a the homeless assistance grants have now. They were, I think for the uh, first time probably were over four billion dollars. We're now talking about a situation where when I started doing this work twenty five years ago. Um, CDBG was over $3 billion and the homeless programs were at 800 million. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure, I know part of what it says is that unfortunately homelessness has continued to be a real challenge, but this is now the largest competitive program in the federal government. Um, so it's a very, uh, a significant investment and, uh, I'm putting a little plug here, uh, for those of you who may have, uh, participated in our rural homelessness summit at the, uh, HAC conference. Stay tuned for um, some exciting initiatives around rural homelessness going forward. Um, HACK is, is, is working closely with the National Alliance to End Homelessness to create a, a rural homelessness um, task force. Um, it's a little plug for that. Um, and then housing opportunities, HOPWA, housing opportunities for people with AIDS, um, proposing steady uh, funding relative to um, the FY24 enacted budget. Um, and uh, again, uh, looking across some uh, smaller but important uh, HUD programs, um, 202 program, uh, we're uh, looking at a slight increase over the FY24 budget, uh, also an, uh, a fairly uh, healthy increase in 811 yeah. housing for the disabled. Um, and I think that uh, uh, you know, that's something that I want to, you know, uh, have people keep an eye on and 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 we'll be looking at this is that that uh, we know so many people uh, in the 515 portfolio, two thirds, over two thirds of tenants are elderly or disabled. And uh, I think like like all all of us, you know, eventually we're all going to be elderly. And and, uh, uh, you know, certainly if you look at the. Uh, uh, the folks who are living in in 515, oh there's uh, a likelihood that many of them uh, are not, you know, they want to stay there. Um, and I, I was actually lucky enough to uh, visit a project in in Oregon yesterday, uh, yesterday last week, um, where while we were visiting, um, their 96 year old resident was taking a walk around the the project. Um, and and enabling folks to age in place is really a, a you know something that's a, that that's exciting to be able to do. 
um, and I'm I'm hoping that we can um, see both USDA and HUD programs assisting projects together, the braiding of the funding even more than has happened in the past. Um, and then uh, uh, other uh, key programs for housing, healthy homes, uh, and, and let hazard control and housing counseling all basically steady uh, steady state funding um, going forward. Um, now I feel like we kind of well I would say we bur we buried the lead in the in terms of what's exciting, uh, but I think we we did lead with what's most likely to happen. Um, you know I think the hope is that the uh, the uh, the discretionary funding proposals that I've just described. Um, you know, have a real chance of of being enacted because they are proposed uh, within the one percent uh, budget increase. But as I mentioned, um, mandatory spending uh, is not subject to the budget caps, uh, and this is really where I think uh, what's important is uh, as a signal for uh, what this administration thinks should be priorities. Um, should they get a second term? Because let me take a step back here. Um, spoiler alert, this budget is not going to get enacted before the election in November. Um, even in non-election years, you can see where we've been at the last couple of years in terms of getting a budget enacted. There's no way this is going to get enacted before the election. Um, and what happens after that is, is um, you know, depends on the outcome of the election. But if this administration gets a second term, I think what's important is this signals, uh, uh, you know, the populations and the interventions they think are are critical. Um, and I, I would just say as a backdrop here, um, President Biden's State of the Union talked more about housing um, than any State of Union uh, in recent memory, even uh, during the period of the Great Recession, which was caused by a crisis in housing. Um, so I, I think, uh, you know, for those of us who've been saying there's been a housing crisis uh, and a need to preserve and increase the housing supply for a long time, you know, the moment is kind of happening. Um, and uh, so these proposals are, are exciting to see. Um, as I mentioned, they're not going to get to the finish line um, for sure before the election. They've proposed a $20 billion. Um, oh, and I should, yeah, as I said, this is all within the HUD budget. $20 billion for a new innovation fund for housing expansion. And this is a very flexible pot, uh, a, a, a competitive pot of money um, to help remove barriers, you know, zoning other things and, and gr uh, making grants to increase the housing supply. Um, and that also includes uh, preservation. Uh, $10 billion for a new first generation uh, down payment assistance uh, program. I think uh, it's pretty clear that, that this is hoping to um, not only move uh, uh, people into home ownership, given the challenges of the housing market, but also close the racial wealth gap. But obviously, given the current Supreme Court, um, you know, there are, are reasons uh, to uh, focus on first generation rather than than um, targeting of, of a particular, uh, you know, uh, race based uh, initiatives around around this. Uh, but clearly we'll have a positive disparate impact uh, for closing the racial wealth gap. Uh, Three billion dollars for eviction reduction efforts um, and. Uh, $8 billion for uh, uh, homelessness grants to address the uptick in homelessness. And I, I would say two things here uh, about sort of the work for us going forward. Um, oh, and I should just say around uh, uh, the homelessness grants, um, uh, yeah, uh, that is actually, let me just move forward here. Ah. Let me just uh, continue. Uh, so $8 billion in homelessness grants, $7.5 billion for new project-based rental consist assistance contracts for uh, uh, extremely low-income households below 30% of area median income, uh, $7.5 billion for public housing um, uh, preservation, modernization, revitalization, $9.2 billion for vouchers. Uh, for all 20,000 uh, youth estimated to be aging out of foster care, $13.1 billion for vouchers for all 400,000 
um, extremely low income veteran families, creating the this would be the first entitlement to a voucher for any population, um, which is a really important signal, um, particularly just going back for a moment for when we thought that there was um, yeah, at the beginning of the Biden administration, opportunity for uh, build back better elements that would have housing. The administration proposed a fairly insignificant number of vouchers relative to uh, capital uh, expenses, uh, investments in housing. So this is a this is a really important signal about where they may be going if they have another opportunity. And then three billion dollars for emergency rental assistance for older adults at risk of of homelessness. Um, yeah, well, I just want to make sure that's OK, good. I'm going to I'm going to go back for a second just to before turning it back over to Sam uh, to some really critical programs that that hack and many of you work with is just to talk a bit about what what is our work um, around uh, the the budget going forward, uh, you know, big picture HUD and USDA um, first. There's nothing that says there couldn't be mandatory spending proposals in the USDA programs to address uh, the rural housing needs. Um, so I, I, I feel like we have done collectively a great job of raising the profile of rural housing um, within the administration and certainly in Congress. I think for those um, who may have been tracking, there was a hearing in the Senate Banking Committee um, yesterday on bipartisan housing proposals. And basically they only almost only had one proposal to talk about, which was the Rural Housing Service Reform Act. Um, and that was really, that's really exciting. Um, but the fact that there are many billions of dollars proposed on the mandatory side to address housing and none of it is in the USDA budget is, is troubling to me. <laughs> so um, uh, in the FY26 budget, particularly if this administration gets a second term, uh, I would like to see a better balance uh, around that. That being said, um, we also want, Hack has been, and we want with all of you to, to make sure that this HUD funding uh, has built into it targeting to rural areas and to rural providers. Because of course, as you all know, HUD funding does uh, work in rural areas, um, but it is often not designed well and um, I certainly have become a, um, my alarm bells go off whenever I see competitive anymore, because absent um, some effort to make sure uh, that rural areas can compete fairly with, with, with others, um, you, you, you tend to see more of the same um, in terms of, of who, gets, uh, who gets funding and it tends to be urban and suburban areas. So, um, you know, the, the, I think some people talk about the, the sort of the phrase that are act as if we're going to act as if these these uh, spending proposals might have a chance of being enacted um, over the next few months, even though we know that they won't actually be fully enacted because uh, we want um, this administration to be thinking through about how everything they do, how is it going to play out? uh and help or not help rural areas as much as it um could um so with that i'm going to stop talking about um uh three theoretical programs that are theoretically not well designed to serve uh rural areas and help you and, and turn it over to sam to the the exact positive opposite which is the programs that have been incredibly successful um for us um uh going going forward um, so Sam, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Sounds good. Um, <clears throat> so here we kind of wanted to wrap today with talking about a few small, but really impactful programs, um, that are near and dear to hacks heart. Um, first we have the self-help home ownership opportunity program or the shop program at HUD. Um, as you can see here, that program did see, a, a bit of a haircut in the FY 2025 White House budget. Um, it had been kind of as some historical background, it had been flat funded at $10 million a year for quite a few years up until recently um, when we've seen kind of small incremental uh, funding increases up to a peak of 13 and a half million. Um, and just kind of for some perspective, 
the four shop organizations receive over $40 million a year in shop applications. So even that 13 and a half million isn't, you know, isn't nearly reflective of the need on the ground. Um, so we were disappointed to see that cut back to 9 million in the White House budget this year. Um, same thing with the Rural Capacity Building or RCB program at HUD. Um, that program had also been flat funded at $5 million for a long, long time. And then in the last couple of years has seen a little bump up to $6 million. Um, it was cut back to that that previous $5 million in the White House budget this year. Um, and then on the USDA side, the Rural Community Development Initiative Program, which is, which is a technical assistance program, um, was kind of flat funded at, at $6 million. That's basically the level that it's been at um, since its creation, with the exception of this past year when it was cut down to $5 million. Um, so those are three programs. Um, that hack accesses directly and that we feel it, are really impactful, you know, 10 million, $5 million, really, really small programs um, within HUD and USDA, but really um, a lot of impact from those programs, especially on the technical assistance side. Um, so kind of looking forward to our advocacy and education with Congress in the upcoming year, you know, based on what we're seeing in this White House budget, um, a huge priority for HACC is the preservation of the USDA multifamily portfolio. So we're really going to be um, kind of championing that NPR increase that we talked about earlier, um, increases in the other multifamily programs like 515, restarting programs like the Preservation Revolving Loan Fund. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for Congress to make some headway on preservation, but it's definitely going to require some funding um, that we have kind of yet to see come to fruition through the appropriations process in the last few years. Um, and like Jonathan mentioned, this uh, most recent funding deal included um, this pilot program for the decoupling of 515 maturing mortgages to allow that 521 rental assistance to continue on after the mortgage matures, um, which we were really excited to see. It's limited to 1,000 units for this year, which we think is probably a responsible decision um, just to kind of allow USDA some breathing room to to get the program underway before we really open the floodgates there. Um, so we're going to be working closely with USDA and with the Hill to make sure that that pilot program um, is as successful as possible this year and hopefully will be expanded in future years, either through the appropriations process or through that RHS Reform Act that Jonathan mentioned um, that's kind of working its way through um, through the legislative process on the Hill right now. Um, and then in addition to multifamily preservation at USDA, we're going to be focusing on funding for those technical assistance programs that I mentioned, RCB and RCDI, um, and then the SHOP program for self-help homeownership. Um, we're going to be definitely focusing on making sure that that program doesn't see any cuts um, in this year. Uh, to continue to address that need for, for home ownership in rural communities. Um, and if you're interested in learning a little bit more about HACS policy priorities, we do publish kind of this annual document um, that covers a whole variety of our housing priorities um, from rural homelessness to rural rental issues to home ownership in rural communities. Um, we talk about kind of the the high needs rural regions or the persistent poverty counties that are so core to HACS mission. Um, so the link here on this slide will take you directly to that document. We do update it every year. And if you have any thoughts on places that you'd like to see us expand um, our policy work, we would love to hear um, hear that from from folks on the ground as well because we we do put some thought into how we can expand the pi the policy priorities um, to really address the needs that you all are seeing each year as well. 
Um, and with that, I believe if you scan this QR code, you can sign up for Hack's bi-weekly newsletter, The Hack News. Um, I'm sure many of you are already signed up. Uh, Leslie Strauss in our office puts together this great newsletter every other Thursday um, that has a lot of different funding opportunities and rural housing uh, breaking news information. Um, so I'd encourage you to sign up for the Hack News if you haven't already. And then I'll defer to Jonathan, but I think we can generally open it up for questions if anyone has anything. I know I've I've seen a couple in the chat that we could address. Yeah, that, while we uh, g um, uh, gather those up, I'll just close up by saying that uh, you know one. One of the things a little bit frustrating is looking at at at, at, at the presentation that I, although I I am not a sailor or uh, someone who particularly kayaks, but it feels a little, a little bit like with respect to RCB and shop and these programs, um, yeah, it would be nice to have the wind at our sails and a president's budget with proposed increases, but we kind of have to row ourselves in uh, you know in the in the congressional session. That I think it's really been a, a testament to. To all of you uh, and your help that we we have been able to increase funding over the president's budget request, which I think, as you can see, if you look at, at a lot of other programs, that's extremely uh, difficult to do. Um, and going forward, it'd be nice if we don't have to do that. Um, so with that, I'll, we can turn it over for questions. Um, it looks like, so there's a question in the chat from Joanna Donahoe from the South Dakota Native Homeownership Coalition um, asking, have there been any discussions around um, funding for the Section 525 Technical Assistance Program at USDA? Um, I'd say yes, but we, at least in my experience, haven't gotten a ton of traction on the Hill around restarting the funding for that program. Um, for folks who aren't familiar, this program hasn't been funded um, in quite a few years, but it was successfully used um, both in Indian country and I believe for the some of the single family programs like 502 and 504, it could be a really powerful asset. Um, like I mentioned, that 504 program hasn't been obligating its all of its funding every year. And I know um, for those of you who have kind of been in the hack orbit for a while, Mike Feinberg from our research team, um, who retired a few years ago, was a huge advocate for refunding, restarting the funding for the 525 technical assistance program. Um, so it's definitely been on our list and we've raised it in different conversations. Um, you know, with the RHS Reform Act moving forward, we we raised it with in the context of that bill, but it, we just haven't gotten a ton of traction there, but it is definitely something that we could kind of double down a little bit more on this year, um, because that would be a good resource to, to get funding for. Yeah, and I would add that to the, first of all, I, I... I, I'm still a relative newbie, but I, I often feel like we 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 lose people outside our little world as soon as we name a number that starts with five. They can't follow us. But that being said, I, I do think this belongs along with the uh, um, I shouldn't call it, uh, uh, PRLF. We, we can't say the full name preservation revolving loan fund on a, a PowerPoint, but like. We need to revive these programs because of what they do. You know, that that's this targeted technical assistance and PRLF is long term low interest money that's really critical. Um, you know, that we really uh have to do the education now and then hopefully there's an opportunity to to revive them. And particularly, I think the the pitch that we need to make is that these major investments um, you know, that the administration is proposing absent investments in technical assistance and capacity building, they're not gonna work in rural areas. So um, next question. Um, we had somebody else in the chat who asked, do you see any impact with the resignation of HUD Secretary Fudge um, on this proposed budget? Jonathan, do you have any thoughts there? Yeah, so I, what I would say is, first of all, I think it's really striking that with the Biden administration, like the Obama administration, um, cabinet secretaries have been really long serving, um, um, which I, I, I think 
speaks to the functionality of the administration. And Secretary Fudge was pretty public about wanting to be the Secretary of, Ag of Agriculture, um, and yet has stayed really to the end of the, the first term. Um, uh, and it, the, the pretty significant indication that that she's not stepping down because of any political difference, but she has, you know, personal, uh, you know, matters. Um, I think in terms of the impact, um, we're very happy that Deputy Secretary Todman has been named the acting person. She is a um, uh, just she's a Hauser through and through. Um, and I won't say a recently converted, but she's been a huge advocate uh, uh, within the administration, within HUD for focusing on rural. Uh, I was lucky enough to, to be in Arkansas with her during the announcement of the uh, latest RCB and SHOP awards. Um, or the last round of, of shop awards. So, um, and she has deep experience. So, so while she is acting, uh, I think there's a lot of work that we can be doing. I ha I don't know. Uh, so she's going to keep the trains running. I, I think with a split Congress and the election coming up, I don't even know if they're going to nominate somebody, but they're certainly not going to get anybody confirmed. So um, I actually think that the short-term impact um, is going to be, you know, positive in the sense that, uh, the person who is going to be the acting secretary um, has extremely deep housing knowledge. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. And Deputy Secretary Todman was also one of our um, keynote speakers at the HAC conference back in October. Um, we might have a video recording from that session. Yep. I'll post it in the chat if I can find it. But she, she gave a great speech and has been a good um, advocate for rural. So we're excited to see her kind of in that acting position for the time being once Secretary Fudge departs. Um, those are the only questions I see in the chat so far. And folks can feel free, I believe, to unmute and ask a question if they have one as well. Um, Allison? Um, yes, I am curious as to how much heck, I'm I'm new to your organization. Thrilled to have found you all because um, I'm just now venturing into rural housing. I am curious as to how you all work with or think about low income housing tax credits in rural areas, like HUD programming. These tax projects often don't make their way into rural areas. Um, and I'm just wondering about what allocation you're seeing for that. And um, can there be better partnership linkages between maybe some rural housing and low-income housing tax credit dollars? So yeah, uh, thank you um, for that question. Um, uh, it I couldn't, couldn't have teed up a better one uh, for us because we didn't talk about uh, the tax provisions in the FY25 budget. Um, so, uh, first of all, as you know, uh, low income housing tax credits do play a role in rural areas, um, but uh, it's it, it can be challenging. Uh, in, you know, Hack has has done some analysis, um, uh, pretty significant analysis of this, and and uh, tax credits do make their way to rural areas, but the projects tend to be smaller, almost half the size, more you know, more like 44 units rather than 88, and even 44 is a, a pretty large project for rural uh, and serve a slightly lower income population. We were extremely excited. Um, uh, well, actually it hasn't happened. We're hopeful that the tax extenders package, uh, that, the, that, that, that there will be a package that expands the um, low income housing tax credit. I should say that that hack is an active member of uh, uh, of the, the low income housing tax credit advocacy coalitions. Um, we're disappointed that at this point, the tax package does not include designating rural areas uh, as difficult to de develop areas. Um, we have a real hope, uh, you know, that if, if if any negotiations are reopened, that gets included. Um, so uh, so I would what I would say is, um, you know, we are in, involved in that and involved in in trying to ensure that the tax credit um, you know, serves rural areas even better than it does now. But that being said, of course, uh, every state has its own qualified allocation plan. 
Um, and so that that plays a real role there. And then I will you didn't ask about this, but the other tax credit that is included in the president's budget that isn't included in the tax package that's on the table is the uh, Neighborhood Homes Investment Act, um, which is a home ownership uh, tax credit that is um, designed to deal with the appraisal gap. Um, which I, you know, uh, in in rural areas, which I don't even need to explain on this call, but of course is is the uh, reflects the fact that, um, uh, you know, often the appraised value of of uh, of a home is not enough um, to to uh, rehab it and and uh, and for someone to take it on. Uh, so that's another thing that we're very active in. Sam, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. If I missed anything. Nope, I don't think so. Um, we have a couple more questions in the chat. Um, Jill Lorden asked, I can't imagine how they would determine if someone is a first generation home buyer. Have you heard anything about what that would look like? I have not. Um, Jonathan, have you heard anything on how? Um, I I haven't. I know that there are groups that have been working on this. It is a challenge. Um, I, I have to say that, um, you know, that's one of those things we're just reacting as that's one of those things that's sort of like, boy, that gets really important if we get closer to even having <laughs> this program enacted. Um, but we can follow up and see, uh, you know, uh, if if any of the home ownership alliance groups have um, have done research into that. I also this is Leslie Strauss from okay. Hack. I also just put in the chat a sentence from the um, from HUD's budget explanation that says how they would define um, these first time home buyers. I don't know. They don't give any details on how they're going to determine whether your parents own a home. Um, but that's all we know. Sam, are you reading off? Let's see. Uh, yeah, no, I'm looking, I'm looking looking through the chat to see if there are other. OK, let's see. We've got um, one from Nancy Jacobson. How does the rural development mutual self-help housing 523 funding work for the remainder um, of this fiscal year? We've been warned by rural development that 523 grants are going to be severely reduced. Um, the severe reduction would be based on the fiscal 24 number and not the budget that Jonathan said won't pass is the fiscal 25, 25. Yeah. proposal from the administration, which actually would bring the number back up to 32, which is 32 million, which is what it's been at. Um, unfortunately, we're stuck with the amount that passed for 24. Um, whoever has control of the slides right now might want to go back to the slide that shows that amount. Nancy, this is Jill Lorden from Neighborhood Partners. Um, you could give me a call afterwards, but I have talked to a little bit the administration about what they plan to do, given the um, lower funding amount this year, and they're not sure they can do much of anything. She would probably try to um, lower limit new organizations or cut current grants, but she doesn't. The last time she tried to do that, the um, there was a wave of displeasure and she was kind of um, told she couldn't do that. So we'll just have to wait and see what that looks like. They probably don't know yet since it just passed recently. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Jill. Um, and then the next question we have in the chat are, what are the odds of getting a rural set aside for LIHTC? Um, I think kind of working on the state by state 
system for the qualified allocation plans. Some states do have like rural set asides. Some states have tribal set asides. Um, kind of hit or miss there, but we would like to see some rural set asides for for LIHTC for sure. Yeah, let me just I'm just going to add to that at the federal level zero. <laughs> like there's just <laughs> there's just no uh, appetite among the major players, particularly NCSHA to to sort of tie the hands of of their individual state agencies. And I'll take this opportunity to respond to another question in the chat, which is around what what is HAC doing around rural definitions? Um, you know, it, it, everywhere we can, you know, we we try to incentivize or encourage the creation of rural set asides and and um, to have it reflect sort of the latest and greatest in terms of of of, of what should be defined as rural. And I think many of you know um, that we uh, we've advocated very strongly to expand the use of the definition uh, that the FHFA um, uh, uses under their duty to serve uh, program. And, and maybe at some point we can you know drop in the chat that you know that. But obviously we are we, we are really dealing with a challenge that um, there are many different definitions of rural um, and the most common one, which is from OMB is, is a is a pretty blunt tool. Um, so it's a challenge that that we're we're taking on as best we can. There's a question about uh, off farm labor 514 516 technical assistance in the FY24 final budget. Um, I'm looking for that. Yeah. Um, okay. I'll have an answer for you in a minute on that one. Okay, cool. Well, and that's. And Arturo, we can, if we don't find it in the next few minutes, we can follow up. <laughs> we know where to find you, you know where to find us. Sorry, that's from Arturo Alvarado, who's on our board. So, <laughs> we have other questions here. Uh, so, will we be able to give people two minutes back of their time? <laughs> <laughs> two minute coffee break for everyone before their next meeting. Great. Well, thank you, everyone, for taking the time to uh, to join us today. Yes, much appreciated. All Thanks, right, everyone. everyone. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.